Hi, this is Nathan from the Escaping Samsara podcast, and I'm here with Stu Gerling, nice who, thank you, and he's come uh, to visit us here in Bali. How did you start your yoga practice? Oh, um, this goes way back, almost 20 years ago, to, uh, we weren't interested in yoga whatsoever. We were gym rats, we played tennis, we were running, me, oh, myself and my wife, Okay. yeah. Right. So we uh, had always done stuff together and uh, we went on a year out and we, our first stop was Miami Beach because we were sort of into that sort of lifestyle and not all the partying and drugs and everything, I was but, gonna say. but beach, yeah, basically beach. <laughs> oh, and yeah. we sort of liked America and that. So we... Um, what this, year was this, sorry? This was, oh my, I don't know the year, but it would be 20 years ago, I'd say. So uh, maybe so it's... So, yeah, okay. that sort of time. So you weren't wearing... Uh, a suit jacket with the sleeves rolled up. No, I was probably still wearing a singlet, I think. Actually, funny enough, yeah, when right. we look back at old photos, and my wife still wears pink shorts, and I, I'm sure I've got pictures of 20 years ago where she's there with pink shorts and a singlet, and I'm there with a singlet and shorts. So nothing much has changed, really, just the emphasis of the way we live our lives, I suppose. So, um, yeah, we were, in, we were there, and we were going to a gym. We joined a gym because we are going to be there for a month. It was called Crunch and it was real trendy and people had their personal trainers and everything like that. And we were just doing our own thing. And um, this particular place had uh, a glass wall studio and you could do whatever classes you wanted in this membership, you could do stuff. And we would be training in the, in the gym part and see this yoga going on. And I'm not sure it was myself or my wife that said, perhaps we should have a go, it's free, you know, so we can have a go. So we went and um, we started it. And it was quite bizarre because we actually really liked it. None of us had done anything like that before. And actually the woman that was taking it, she was a right bastard. She was like, I'm not starting until I can hear all your breath. You sound like a herd of elephants jumping forwards. And she was like real sort of a bit angry, really. And it was some sort of power yoga type thing. And, um, but because we'd come from that sport environment um, we quite like being pushed and so we thought oh this is alright and uh, so we kept it up for the month we were there and then I think the next stop that we went to was um, Vancouver and there we looked for a yoga studio and we joined a yoga studio they had this special offer going on 10 days for $10 and they were willing to give us the same offer for our, like every time it ran out so it was like crazy we got the practice for nothing and it just happened to be in a Shanga studio because we knew nothing about yoga. We didn't know anything. Was that a uh, Fiona Stang's studio? Uh, maybe it was called Flow oh, Yoga okay. down, down by um, down by the harbour near near. Uh, there's a there's a park that becomes begins with S. Is it um, near where all the nearby the marina? Then there's this sort of park that goes around. The name's forgotten me, but it was down there. And she just happened to be a yoga teacher up from San Francisco and started this new studio with her boyfriend, maybe husband, a really sweet girl. And so she introduced us to the primary series. And the primary series of Ashtanga. Of Ashtanga, yeah. yeah. So I was like, okay, wow, this is cool. So we did that. And then... So what did you like about it? We liked it was hard, I think, mm. basically, to start with. We had no idea of spirituality or any sort of further sort of thing really rather than something physical to do we didn't carry a lot of equipment around with us so that's basically what happened because at the time we had like I think we had four suitcases of 25 kilos each with us for this year out and like two of those I think were sporting equipment like tennis rackets and running shoes and gym shoes and gym equipment and <laughs> it's like went on like that so it was like okay maybe we can ditch some of this if we can find something to do with our bodies that doesn't involve all this stuff and that's sort of what happened. We gradually started doing more and more yoga on the year out. We'd try to find a studio or now we would have up. We had a sequence because we'd learned Ashtanga and we would practice our sequence wherever we went. So the deal with Ashtanga is that it's a set sequence. So you don't necessarily need a teacher to be there. When yeah, this is it. I mean, I think it's always you see in students that don't have a teacher that they've developed certain patterns of movement that they've develop their bad habits shall we say maybe they're avoiding things that they don't like so that's one of the problems of not having a teacher but the the good thing is that you can always practice you, you know sometimes for a lot of people it's very hard to generate a sequence in their head or 
they tend to just do stuff they like, which is also not particularly beneficial for the body. Oh, why, why is that? Because basically you you like things you're good at, and you avoid things that you don't like, which are the things you're not good at, which will then create imbalance in the body because you keep doing what you're already good at and you leave out what you're not so good at. So over time, that will land up with increasing the imbalance in your body, just generally speaking. Okay. That's the way I yeah. sort of think of it. So, um, yeah, we, we basically started doing gym less, doing tennis less, and doing yoga more. And um, that was the start of the journey, really, from that we've been doing it ever since. Mm. And you started interviewing yogis. Mm. Um, so how did that come about? I was on a... TT here in Bali with Gregor Mallet and, and Monica Gucci. Gucci or Gauchi? I was say Gauchi. She's probably like Gucci. <laughs> it's also quite a nice name. I'm going to say Gauchi. Um, sorry for the mispronunciation. Um, beautiful teachers, beautiful people. And uh, I already had a website. And it was at the time, it's back in 2013, I think, where there was more... Um, different types of content on websites and things like that and I was also becoming more interested in what other teachers had to say and and was paying a great deal of attention to yeah just collecting different thoughts from different people and realizing that there was no one way to, to think about a particular subject and so I wanted to sort of collect stuff together and uh, and so I said to Gregor, you know, look, I haven't done anything like this before, you know, can I, can I do an interview with you? And it was an audio back then, I think, was the very first one I did, because I had no equipment. And he said, yeah, sure. And so we, we did, and that was the sort of the first one. And then it was like, oh, this is pretty cool, because actually, I get to ask these teachers everything that's going on in my mind. And it's like, it's like one-on-one -on -one time. So I thought, I must do some more of this. <laughs> and so that's how it started, really. And it was just like... I did some of that for a few years, and then uh, then we sort of transitioned into video because then video was becoming sort of more popular. Um, and then I teamed up with Purple Valley, which was the start of like more prolific uh, videos and interviews and workshops and stuff like that. So it's been a very fun time. Mm. And you're also well, your kind of speciality is is anatomy, right? Yeah. So you also have a, another internet presence, Love Yoga Anatomy, yes. which also includes some interviews, but also other products. So uh, did you have that before you started interviewing? Because you said you had a website. Yeah, so that was all linked in with the website of the same name, the YouTube channel. Um, the, the content was in those days more based around anatomy, more based around sort of more straightforward stuff, some workshops and things like that. Also some Ashtanga stuff, actually, because of the, the fact that most of my network of people I knew was Ashtanga. And, and that's the funny thing, was actually, there was no, uh, there's been no driving uh, ideal or idea behind everything I've done since, I don't know, 20 years ago, really. Everything has happened by mm, just being in a particular place at a particular time and saying, you know, somebody saying, how about you do this? Or how about, and, or us thinking, oh, we're here now, perhaps we'll do this. And so it's so happened that my network has been a Shtanga. And so I've done much more stuff to do with a Shtanga teachers and a Shtanga practice than, than I may have chosen to do otherwise. I, I prefer really to have a much broader appeal, shall we say, and much broader content, because I'm still really like this idea of collecting different thoughts from different people and viewing things from different angles and then putting that together and seeing if there's something that can be individualized, um, not one way will suit all. So, but it just so happens that even now, my network is still very strong with the Ashtanga base, so it mm. seems to be coming from that angle. I mean, one thing I'm interested in what you said was, um, you know, you said you didn't have a driving sort of idea behind mm. it. It kind of just happened, right? Yeah. So would you put that down to just luck or is that something like a little bit more spiritual? Because I know uh, we just finished, my me personally finished a training with Gregor yeah. and he might have called it, Evgeny, what's the word? Svatarma. Svatarma. The, um, I don't know, the, the role that you're here to do. 
So what, what would you put it down to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, difficult. I, I think what do, it comes down to what you believe in, I suppose. Um, I believe in nature. I believe there is some sort of uh, right and wrong, yeah, uh, and some sort of comeuppance. So somehow I bizarrely believe in karma. Even though I don't believe in God, I don't believe there's a God, I don't believe in some extraterrestrial force or something like that. So I've never really thought of myself as a spiritual type of person or led by any sort of spiritual path. Um, however, um, I think I lead my life in a, a spiritual way, if that makes sense. That I wouldn't do anything to anybody else that I wouldn't want done to me. or I try and respect other people for the views they have. I would never, you know, intentionally harm anybody else or anything else. So the same sort of ideals, but for me, maybe I don't have to feel that if I don't live my life in a certain way, that I have some comeuppance later in hell or, or whatever, some penance for not being a good person. In me, it's sort of, well, that's the way you should um, hold yourself. That's the way you should interact with the world is in the right way, in a moral way. So from that point of view, I think I would probably say it's it's more luck. But then you could also say, well, you create your own luck, you know, by either being good at something or by being in a, around the right sort of people that inspire you not to be around people that are negative or draw you back down. So it's I think it's a, a convergence of things, shall we say, that, that thankfully has all led me in the right way but I think a lot of people that that give up this idea of oh I must have a three-year plan I must have a five-year plan I must have a ten-year plan I'm going to do this and I want to be successful I think those people that have given that up and we meet loads of them in the yoga world find that actually things work out and it's like why it's just they, they get led to something that really they, they, there's a passion inside them to do and maybe that only comes to the top when you can let go of the other stuff because it's being clouded by the need to earn money here or the need to do this particular nine to five job that you don't really like or, or that sort of thing. Um, so I think maybe it's in us rather than outside of us and that we somehow manage to tap into that if we're open to letting go and just being free to be guided and by ourselves, shall we say. That's where yeah. I'm coming from. I yeah, think. that makes a lot of sense. And what role, if any, do you think doing yoga might play with that? I mean, my question is that, say you just got really into running, right? Yeah. Would you have been able to find your Svat Dharma, as <laughs> Mr. Running. Mili might say? Or, or does, does yoga, like, I don't know, play a role in that? Because people do view yoga as a more spiritual, quote unquote, thing. Yeah. Do, you think, do you think yoga helped in that process? I think it did, definitely. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure whether it was the physical part of it, okay? So the moving your body in space, like you would be moving your body in space if you were running or playing tennis. I think a lot of it is actually about the people that you're surrounded by and the, the world that you're interacting with because, you know, I I only now really are surrounded by yoga people. I go teach workshops around the world, I travel to places, I stay places, but I mostly interact with yoga people. And, you know, the amount of times I go back and I say to my wife, oh, this was a really nice group of people, you know, it was like, and she said to me, you always say that. And it's true, you know, it really is. It's such a pleasure to be around yoga people. And, and I think that has um, some inspiration to you. And you, if you keep your ears open and, and you're uh, open-minded, then you hear ideas from other people and meeting so many people that, have, that are traveling the world, that have given up all these ideas, I'm sure subconsciously, I probably gave up my original job because I'd heard maybe other people were doing the same thing. So I think when you're, again, you're surrounded by the right type of people, uh, that makes a big difference. I, I don't, you know, to be perfectly honest, I feel a little bit guilty, really. It is still a physical endeavor for me, the yoga. I, I don't do it to, to gain access to a higher power, I think, because I don't believe there's a higher power up there, yeah? 
that, that by no means is me also saying, if you think there is, you're wrong. It's not at all. I could equally be as wrong. And I, I, I was trying to think of this the other day because I was, I was in the shower thinking of the sort of questions you might ask me. And I was thinking, really, you know, my, my concept of the world is actually like a bowl of some sort of broth with these bits sort of floating in it. And you know if you've got to earn the heat. Like, well, so, well, I have to be a vegetarian broth, wouldn't it, I imagine, <laughs> even though, unfortunately, guys, I'm also not vegetarian either. No. I'm, I know I'm disgraced <laughs> at myself. I, I, I say sometimes morally I am, but I know that doesn't cut water. I really should be, but I'm not. Um, but, yeah, you know if you heat something up over the heat and you've got some stuff, bits float to the top, you know, every so and that. And that's how I sort of view... <laughs> my brain and the way that I'm processing living in this world is that there's these ideas that are floating around in this broth that come to the surface and sometimes they seem to make sense, sometimes they don't make sense and sometimes some of them come together and are now things look, you know, more that this would be a way to view things but then before you know it they're moving away from each other and something else is coming up and so I don't have um, any answers for myself really and actually, I'm, I'm not sure that I even want them or need them. Actually, I'm quite happy with myself. I mean, this is not complacent. <laughs> Please don't take it that it's like a little bit smug that I've got everything no, nailed down. No, I don't think you come across as smug. No, it's, yeah. it's like, I don't really care. You know, I'm, I don't have anything. I have no anger inside me to get out. I have no trauma. I, I mean, I've been supremely lucky maybe in my life. I haven't had to deal with some sort of traumatic incident that has left me scarred so I've got nothing, no, none of that to get rid of. I don't feel I need to connect with a higher power, I'm just interested really in connecting with the people that I'm around now mm. you know, for me it's more important so um, it's uh, confused I'd say I'm confused about everything, I'm confused about anatomy which is my speciality you know, nothing makes sense really you know, really <laughs> it's like, sorry so, what is it about anatomy that's not making sense to you? Let's say, what is the most difficult thing that you've come across anatomy-wise in the last 12 months that you just think, like, oh, no, that's, that's well, thrown a... a I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking much more at backbending at the moment. That's my, my thing at the moment, because, um, you know, we're being, we're being influenced greatly um, with social media now in what we do. And, and it's fantastic in, in one point of view because we have this convergence of ideas and I think for the body to be healthy, primarily we shouldn't just do one thing. We shouldn't just do yoga, you know. It doesn't tick all the boxes, yeah. So if you're like, oh no, what did you say? Really, you know, it doesn't really work your cardiovascular system very well. You know, th th we have difficulty strengthening all the muscles because we're spending most of our time pushing or pulling. So if you're, if you're doing something else like surfing would be great, or rock climbing would also be great. What about a swimming? Swimming also, yeah. And some pull-ups pulling. maybe? Pull-ups, that would definitely help. But you're definitely also moving in certain ways. I, I think it's, it's much more... Also you have difficulty really strengthening certain areas of the body. Um, doing yoga, maybe it also emphasizes certain areas of the body more than others. So. I think the body thrives on variety. Um, I know we've gone down sort of a cul-de-sac here, but the body thrives on variety. So I think you need to give it variety rather than one thing all the time, which is problematic for an Ashtanga practitioner. And I love Ashtanga and I do predominantly do Ashtanga. Yeah, so I'm sort of not doing what I preach really. Although nowadays I'm doing a lot more other stuff too, trying to bring in some calisthenic stuff and trying to do a lot more arm balances, handstands, different things that you don't find necessarily until you would potentially go into the third series or something with Ashtanga. But we started this because we were talking about backbendings and, and so these influences that are really good on one point of view because we can get these ideas from calisthenics, we can get these ideas from movement like Ida Portal and all that sort of stuff and all these influences like wow we, we're starting to look at things in different ways and maybe question more. Um, but we're also influenced by um, contortion. And, and, and that is a problem for me because I see contortion as uh, entertainment rather than um, something that is geared towards healthy body, which 
hopefully yoga lives within the health and wellness sphere. And one of the things that we see in contortion is these really deep back bends. And when you look at the construction of the spine from an anatomical perspective, there's much that, that is in the construction of the spine that would indicate that we are not really designed to do deep back bends and also that the body has made us in a certain way to resist a lot of that movement. So we have an anterior longitudinal ligament up the front of the spine, which is thicker than the one on the back of the spine, which would indicate maybe that we shouldn't be going that way too deep. There are the angulation of the spinous processes down the back of the body, particularly in the thoracic area, they're almost lying on each other, so there's not going to be much extension there. Um, we've got the rib cage, which is relatively fixed. We have these what's called articulating processes in the spine, which come up and down from each vertebrate, which also restrict movement in certain areas. So there's sort of many things that are saying, okay, we shouldn't really be going back too far, yet even in the Ashtanga practice, we see a sort of a, a trend towards catching ankles and things like that. Um, and that to me is way, way too uh, deep for most people, yeah? The problem is to do these real deep back bends, most people land up what well, I call hinging somewhere, which to, to talk about it from another point of view would be to move excessively from one or more places, yeah? So the key areas that hinge are the bottom of the ribcage, where it meets the lumbar section, so we call that T12 L1, and the bottom of the lumbar area, so that's where your waist is before it meets your pelvis, where it then meets the sacrum, so we call that L5 S1. And why do why is the hinge points there? What is different about those ligaments, or not well, ligaments, the uh, The construction, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the spine um, has these bits that point up and down, they? so they're called the articulating processes, and they change their orientation as you go up the spine. So if you're listening to this as a podcast, you might have trouble visualizing this, but imagine that the ones in the lumbar area, you've got these little uh, bony bits that are making a joint that basically face front to back in your body. Yeah, okay? And they come together and they make a joint like, uh, like hands together, like in prayer. So they move into extension and flexion very easily, but they don't twist very easily. Yeah? So the lumbar spine is not designed for twisting. Yeah? All the twisting needs to happen up in the rib cage because there those articulating processes change their orientation to a frontal plane. So that's imagining if you are taking a slice through the body from ear to ear, coming right through the body. So now they're facing this way, if you can't see this in the podcast, but basically if I had my hand facing you at camera and then another hand facing it here. So they rotate quite easily around each other, but they don't go flexion extension very easily. Yeah? So you will do flexion more easily in the, in the thoracic area, hence we can round it a bit more. If you go backwards, it's going to be a problem. So we've gone from front to back in the lumbar to, shall we say, side to side in the thoracic, but there has to be some sort of transition. You can't just like whip it round from one angle to another. And those transitions happen at those points where we have that uh, T12 L1 or L5 S1 particularly, they're transitioning areas. So I see that those angulations are a little bit of this and a little bit of that, which allows a little bit more movement because of the fact that uh, it is a transitional area. Now, because we've got more movement, it then is less stable. So because it's less stable, it can be, in my point of view, taken advantage of. Yeah? Mm. And so the people that I see that can do these really deep back bends, maybe they're missing a little bit of one of the spinous processes also, which the bits that stick towards the back of your body on your spine, if that's a little bit shorter than one of them, then maybe they can go a little bit further before they touch each other and then would stop you going backwards anyway. Would that anywhere. be a genetic thing? Yeah, that would be a genetic thing. It's not something you'd like sort of break off a bit of the end, I don't think. But mm. yeah, so you're born to be able to move there in a certain way. Now, do you consider that as a defect or... So like if you had a defect in your car that allowed you to turn a little bit more to the right than the left, yeah, would you then use that defect and make sure you got a good old whack around on the wheel every time you did a right hand turn? Or would you think, that's really something that's gonna go wrong if I keep on doing that on the on the right? And and this is what I'm afraid of, is that you know, while you're strong, while you're healthy, while you're young, 
we know that strength of the core in particular is a key component to a healthy back bend, yeah, as well as open shoulders, open hips in the right directions. That's cool. Okay, so I'm doing my back bends now and I'm going really deep, but I feel really fine. But as I get older and I'm now losing that strength, am I going to have the same integrity to protect those areas that I've introduced excessive movement in? And, and so this is the, the sorts of problems I see is that, you know, with the, the tendency to of, perform. Right. Um, sorry, you want to finish up? The now. tendency to perform, then we, we go deeper, basically. And by going deeper, we put the body in jeopardy. That's, that's the way I, I see it. Yeah. Yeah. It becomes less about the health and more about um, how deep can I go? And where do you stop? You know, why don't you can get your ankles all and not go all the way through? You know, there's, you know. I mean, there's another element to it, though, which is the, I suppose, say, psychological, emotional element. Mm. You know? I mean, it's well known in the yoga world that back bends. I mean, let's take Ashtanga, for example, people who go through the back bending process, you might say, by doing yeah. the first bit of second series, say they're not so used to doing back bends. Mm. It's very common. You can Google this. People talk about, you know, crying and things coming up and like getting to grips with some kind of emotional stuff and they feel that the back bends are, are helping them in a kind of psycho spiritual way um so is that something that could be a reason to maybe do the deeper back bends? to do them um i think the the back bends at the beginning of the second series i think are beneficial for the majority of people even if they haven't finished the primary series so i would highly recommend that under the guidance of a teacher they, they do those back bends at the beginning. Even Kapotasana, which is a quite extreme one. Yeah, no, for me... Yeah. You draw the line I draw the line at Kapo, yeah. Okay. Um, that then is becoming a, a very deep back bend and requires good opening in the shoulders and flexion whilst maintaining external rotation, sorry about that. And also good opening in the hips as far as extension goes in a strong core. A lot of people don't have that, and again, because of the angulation of the body, they just hinge somewhere in order to complete the posture. So, much more difficult to control than the Shalabhasana, shall we say, and the Ustrasana, and even the Lagu is quite strengthening. Could I mention um, Lagu Vajrasana B, right? Yes. So, that sometimes is quite a good alternative to Kapo, um, because you know, there seems to be like like more of an arch. Yes, there is more of an arch. There. So you're grabbing your knees for the people that... Yeah, are you're listening. holding your knees and mm. then like basically doing almost like, I suppose, a drop back kind of thing. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, for me, you know, if I'm going to stick <clears throat> to this route, and I'm not sure, you know, these are these are ideas that are forming in my head. Um, as I say, I'm, I haven't necessarily, but I suppose I have really put myself on one camp, and that is that deep back bends are probably not sensible. Um, but I'm also open to the idea that I'm also wrong and that there's many yoga practitioners that are doing beautiful stuff that you think, well, actually, that still looks healthy. So let's think about yeah, the fact that... Do we need to cut? Oh. Sorry. Do we need to cut? Memory card is... It's full. full. It's really? I was trying to explain that after this, you can cut this, because you have the back ones cut. Okay. You're kidding. Yeah, this one. This one? Card is full, Are you so filming in 4K? No, like, well, I... Potentially defective, yeah, that it's out of the norm, therefore we really shouldn't be moving there, so maybe we're moving there, and so that what are the consequences of that? And the other sort of idea as well, yeah, okay, all the time you're young and strong, maybe you've got the strength to protect that area, but when you get old and you get weaker and things maybe start loosening up more, have you then got an air which is going to give you vulnerability and how are you going to age? Because at the end of the day, we're hopefully doing a practice that is healthy for us, yeah? that, we're, is going to, that we can continue into our later life. Yeah? Hmm. I mean, one thing I, I heard someone say who was an advanced Ashtanga practitioner, yep. uh, it was about leg behind the head poses. Yes. And the point was made, you know, how is this going to help you as you get older? And yeah. the reply was, well, look, I'm not doing this so I can climb the stairs when I'm 70. I d you know, I'm doing this because I guess I in the implication was they enjoy it, they yeah. get some kind of gratification beyond the kind of physical training. Um, 
Do you think that's kind of valid, or are they kind of will they be regretting those words? Do you think they'll be using <laughs> those words at some point? Well, you know, there, there's certain movements in any postural yoga, and it isn't just Ashtanga, that you look at those movements and you say that is way beyond the functional necessity to interact with the world. Yeah, foot behind head would be one of those. If your body is designed in such a way as to accommodate that movement. And there will be a difference in the individuals between the directionality of the hip socket, directionality of the head of the femur, that sort of stuff, that maybe makes it a little bit easier for some people than others, yeah? If you have that movement available to you, then of course there's two questions. One is, are you destabilizing the hip by, again, moving into that sort of area just because you can, and what are the long-term benefits, yeah, or potential detriments? And then on the other side, if you really are designed in such a way that that movement is going to be very problematic, could you potentially be causing issues by trying to go that deep at the hip? When again, interacting with the world, you really don't need that sort of range of motion. The problem is, we could then take that to the other extreme and say, well, what do we need to interact with the world? We could sit on a chair, we could bend, if we want to pick something off from the floor, we just bend our knees. Um, we don't really need to squat because we've got toilets at the moment and probably we don't really need to back then because you know everything's in front of us that would be a pretty crap body to live in wouldn't it you know I think one of the things that that maybe I notice in, a, in I was going to say Ashtang but I don't mean Ashtang I just mean yoga people in general <coughs> is that generally speaking they seem much younger than they are yeah that you meet people in their 60s that have a vibrancy and a life to them. And I think that comes from the way that they can interact with their environment in a very fluid way. And that comes from the mobility and strength around the joints. And so that keeps them young and childlike, I think. And that then leads into the mentality. Yeah. So I think we do need more than just whatever it is we need to interact with the world. It's just when we take it to the extremes, can we potentially cause issues? And that wouldn't be in everybody. It might be in those people that are potentially vulnerable. Yeah. But for instance, my um, father-in-law, he, he's run uh, from, I don't know, from 20, I suppose, quite young, and he's now in his 70s. He's, I think he's just stopped running now. But I don't think he ever had an injury. I don't think he ever had bad knees. He used to run like five, six marathons. He's had no problem. I don't think he's even been to hospital, you know. So, but there's something about his body that is particularly robust. Somebody else, if they'd run the sort of distances that he'd done and the regularity that he'd done, probably would have caused some issues. So, this is a, some of it is knowing and accepting the type of body you're living in without cutting your wings off because that's also important we need to fly we need to excel and to be the best we possibly can not for anybody else but just for ourselves so we don't want to stifle that but we also need to be realistic in the fact that we aren't all built the same and some people will be much more likely to do a particular position without hurting themselves than others yeah so i'm very much about one shape doesn't fit all, one practice doesn't fit all, one whatever doesn't fit all. We are individuals, we have similarities, but we are individual and we need to think about that. And that goes for a lot of these deep postures that mm. it might be fine for this person, but maybe not fine for me if I am compromising my body by rounding my spine too much and putting the pressure on my neck because my foot isn't in the right place when I'm doing foot behind head because I'm not open enough in the hip. That, that's more what I have a problem with, is people compromising their body in order to achieve a particular result when they need to go back to the foundational movements and get those in place first, and then their body will be in a much safer position to actually do the posture and give you a realistic view as to whether that posture is available to you. Mm. Thanks. So, one um, another way of looking at it, which I think I have heard this from Simon Borg-Olivier, who's mm -hmm. another yoga teacher, mm. 
he has this idea of a traditional Lovely body. Have you heard this idea? No, go ahead. So, you know, a traditional body would be what the human body was like, say, for all humans 150 or 200 years ago and before that i.e. these are people who are carrying stuff on their heads, they're squatting, they're doing a lot more movements, they're not sitting on a computer all day. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea of a traditional body. And I think maybe the thought is that that's kind of a little bit more ideal. Um, that's something that maybe we as modern people should be aiming for, to, to have the kind of body that you might have seen in India, say, 200 years ago, if they were healthy, and that, yeah. that range of movement. I think it's a it, it's a good idea. It starts from a very good place, and I've heard um, other things along those same lines. Um, there's plenty of stuff that we don't need to do now because of the comfortable way that we live. Squatting would be one of those. You know, yeah. it, um, it just reminds me of a, a friend of mine who, um, having practiced Marcha Asana, C the yes. twist was much better at reaching for the toilet paper, which is inevitably on the back, the back of the, exactly. on the system, right? Yeah, exactly. So now you can do that. So he can interact with his world in a more comfortable way. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I think, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna sound in a way it's like a horrible person sometimes, but um, I'm really disappointed with most of the human race, to be honest, you know. I think we are mostly grazers, yeah? hippopotamuses just wandering around eating whatever comes next hardly exercising um, you know we have no predators yeah um, and so therefore we don't need to be fit healthy strong agile alert for for danger because we live in a times unless you live in down down LA or something like that we've got somebody in the doorway we don't have many dangers so when you look at when you look at wild animals, most of them are in tremendous shape. They're like fantastic specimens of, of evolution. And then when I look at the human race, most of the time I'm, I'm, well, most of the time I'm disappointed because I think, what a waste, you know, look at that fantastic body you've got and you're just doing nothing with it. And then I see some examples um, of like ex excellence and you think wow I never knew the body could do that you know so we have the two extremes but so I'm coming from that angle that um, I suppose we should be doing a lot more than we do yeah and to think back to those times when we needed to do it is a good reference point to think well those are the sorts of things that we should be doing so I think unless you've got dodgy knees and you've got a certain hip um, makeup or whatever, it would be nice to be able to squat, yeah, for most people. I think there's great benefits to that, yeah. <laughs> a story along those same lines, I took my mum and her friends, they would have been in their 80s, I suppose, then, to Kerala, and we were out on the houseboat in the, on the lovely waterways there, and of course, they needed to go to the loo, so the guy said, oh, we know, I know somewhere he's got a house, but of course, it was a squat toilet. So it's like, oh my God, these ladies had never squatted in their lives to go to the loo. So it was the most, you know, they came out in hysterics because it was just such a bizarre situation that they had to sort of try and squat, but it meant hanging on to things and this, that, and that. Because they never, you don't have to do that. But um, that climbing, hanging, great for the shoulders, great for opening up the wrists, the wrist strength, um, running even, you know, to work on that cardiovascular system. And it, Yoga people, dreadful, basically, cardiovascular. I used to work, I have a massage area, three floors up, yeah? The number of yoga practitioners that would come to me, I only ever dealt with yoga practitioners, they'd get to the top, <sighs> why the hell didn't you have somewhere on the ground floor? It's like, hold on, you do two hours of yoga in the morning, you should be able to walk up three flights of stairs, you know? So it's like, there's, it's not only movements, it's also fitness as well, and strength, you know? How many people, can't hold themselves up or lower themselves down in a chaturanga, but yeah. Um, now take, the, so that's yoga practitioners in themselves that have trouble lowering themselves down. Now take the general public and say, you know, can you hold yourself, uh, could you lift your body weight up, could you pull yourself up onto the roof if you needed to because you've just fallen off and otherwise you're going to fall to your death, yeah. So many people are so weak because they don't actually do anything with their bodies, yeah. Mm. So, there's, there's like a tirade of insults on the human race, isn't it? 
But it's a little bit like that, coming from a sport and fitness background, years in the gym, studying the body. It's like, bloody hell, most people are just wasting this amazing vehicle that we have for interacting with the world. Yeah. Was that the answer you were expecting? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I definitely see where you're coming from. Um, and yeah, you know, like learning to move for me personally has been an amazing journey that's brought kind of benefits and experiences that I would never have expected, right? And there is something about yoga that you mentioned where it makes people look younger mm. and it's kind of weird. I guess the, the answer would be that yoga is kind of more based in cultivating prana or life force, um, whereas other exercises are not. Um, but obviously that's kind of a nebulous term, especially for someone with a science background like yourself. <laughs> Atheist so, or agnostic, whatever yeah. way you want to think of it. <laughs> but like, you, you've got to, you, you say yourself that yoga people do weirdly look younger, they have a vibrance about mm. it. So, so what is it that they're, that they're getting out of it that's making that happen? I think it is that mobility, that um, freeness of spirit, I think maybe also. Um, a lot of yoga practitioners, you know, do seek alternative lifestyles as well. So they get themselves out of that rat race, they get themselves out of the depression of turning up at a particular job that you really don't like, doing what you have to do to earn a particular wage to support family or whatever. Um, so I think that freedom from the weight of responsibility and uh, need to do certain things, I think also gives certain youth and vibrancy. Isn't it also about sensitivity? Because I think for me, it just made me feel a, a greater sensitivity in my body so that when like hangovers were, became way worse, mm. I just couldn't cope anymore. And I felt more the consequences of unhealthy decisions because I somehow the yoga helped increase a sort of internal sensitivity. The word, uh, is it periposception? Peri, the, in, the proprioception. Proprioception. You've got a cat attacking Stu, unfortunately. <laughs> it didn't like me comparing human race to animals, I think it was. Yeah, she's, <laughs> it's like, no, what are you doing? Yeah. Cursing us all with your afflictions. <laughs> no, she's, no she's, she's off now. Um, we'll see if she comes back. Um, what were you saying? Peri how do you say proprioception that proprioception yeah. right knowing and where your body an, is in space that's, a, that's an interesting um, benefit you get from yoga right and yeah I mean we all have that ability um, the, the body is doing it all the time so could you maybe we, could you just please define uh, the, proprioception yeah. proprioception is the ability to for your body to know where everything is in space yeah so for instance if you're listening to this and you close your eyes and you bring your fingertip to your nose you can do it without actually looking at your finger, yeah? Your body knows where everything is and it can maneuver you to the right sort of place. Um, so that you can get more sensitive of also becoming more in tune with how the body is interacting with other stuff, how it feels in certain areas. I mean, I know a lot of people before they start yoga, don't even realize that they're tighter on one side of their body than the other until they start moving their body in a certain way. It's like, oh, okay, now I see that this arm doesn't move quite the same as that. That ankle doesn't rotate quite the same as this. So because we're using our body, we're getting to talk to it and we're getting to learn stuff and, and getting a more direct um, response with the body. I think that definitely also leads into us being more aware of what we do, maybe more aware of the postures that we hold that might be detrimental to us. Um, you were, we started this because you were talking about, you know, why yoga people look younger. Um, it isn't just the physicality, you're quite right. Uh, it is a lifestyle, yeah? And I think a lot of people that maybe weren't necessarily health conscious as far as what they ate, um, what they drank, whether they smoked, all that sort of stuff, when they start yoga, they are then around other people that are living in a more healthy way, and then you start to adapt to your environment, I think, and you drop a lot of those potentially not very beneficial habits. Yeah? Mm. There's not so many people, I'm going to get told off here again, I suppose, there's not too many people that are grossly overweight that practice yoga. 
you know, smoking, okay, there is a, a hardcore that still want to smoke their ganja yeah. or whatever, but, you know, the, you, you become, you tend to drop those things because you find they're not really necessary, really. So I think that makes you healthy as well, so more likely to live longer. If you're overweight, smoke, drink, you're going to drop dead in your 50, 60, basically. Mm. Mm. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Well, um, I, you're just coming from a science background, right? So I yeah. imagine that's informed by, you're not just sounding off. I mean, you... I got a BSc in health stuff. studies, um, but I'm mostly sounding off, really, to be honest. <laughs> you know, it's like, whatever we, whatever we think we know, uh, we probably know less than what we think, and it's all dependent on what we've been subjected to. So I only know what either somebody has told me or what I've read. Hmm. There may be a whole... It may be just a tiny tip of an iceberg, and there's so much that I don't know. And when it comes to the human body, that's a definite for sure. Yeah, the human body is so complicated. So um, whatever we think we know, we only know a partial picture, and that will change anyway because I mean, science yeah. is changing. Their ideas are changing. Yeah. Mm. So it's an opinion. Yeah. Mm. It, whoever, no matter how much they think they know, it's an opinion. That's all. For sure, and that's an excellent caveat for all the people that might try something and see. Yeah. So, um, destabilizing. Right? Yes. Now, this is this is something that we're told we need to avoid. Do do this too much, you're going to destabilize this joint and that joint. Mm. But like, I'm not sure what destabilizing really means. All I've got is a picture in my head of some kind of like wobbly, you know, <laughs> human that can't like, you know, because we we're full of ligaments that are designed to keep us in check, right? So, you know, and ligaments I I, I hear are very tough and they don't change their constitutional makeup that much so if you say don't do this it's destabilizing I mean what does that what does that what does it mean mm. um, from my perspective I think what we're talking about is some joints are inherently stable yeah and some joints are inherently instable to start with so if you compare your hip to your shoulder both ball and socket joints yeah but the hip is heavily ligamented because we are weight bearing on the time and we're walking around on it all the time. And so it, it needs to be much stronger. There's also lots of muscles that are crossing it that are also helping to make that joint. Plus it's got a very deep socket. So the head of the femur fits into that deeper socket. So it's inherently stable. If we compare that to the shoulder, the socket is much more shallow in order to facilitate interacting with the world, which is what we want to do with the arms. We don't necessarily want to do that with the legs then the shoulder is much more likely ligamented, yeah? So there's some muscles around the shoulder that also serve a role in supporting the shoulder and maintaining that stability, yeah? So if we then take that shoulder to extreme ranges of motion, we may be going to a stage where it's difficult for the muscles to control that movement, maybe difficult for the ligaments to control the movements because it is already inherently unstable anyway. So what we're then getting is something where um, we increase the likelihood of injury. Yeah. So this is what we're thinking about for people also that are maybe hypermobile, that we don't want to necessarily give them more mobility or more flexibility. There's a difference between the two, but we'll just go with that for a moment. Um, we want to strengthen them up so that they can control the ranges of motion that they have. So that's what we want, the opposite to destabilizing is to maybe have the same ranges of motion but to be able to control those ranges of motion what we don't want is a body that can flip flop around into particular positions we really haven't got the strength to control that range of motion mm. so what if someone was hinging in the the joints that you've mentioned yes. but they can control let's say they can go very smoothly into that thing and into that movement so they're going back to back bends Yes, yeah, let's say okay. we're going into a back bend. Let's say they're hinging, yeah. they're doing it with control, they're entering it very smoothly, coming yeah. in and out, they've got very strong core. Yeah. Um, is that destabilizing or is that, <laughs> is that wrong? Is that because. Yeah. Um, so the, pretend, let's say how deep they go. So this is, this is the thing. They could do, say, an Urdhva Asana where their legs are maybe three foot away from their hands. Mm. That's not a, a scientific measurement. I'm just putting it out the sky, okay? Let's say they're doing a relatively uh, wide pl placement of the feet relative to their hands, and they've controlled themselves back. They have that potential to hinge, but they have controlled their core, 
and they have created a nice smooth curve. For me, there's nothing destabilizing about that. In fact, it's very good because they're controlling an area where they would potentially easily go into. So they're working with consciousness and they're working with control. They then decide to start walking their hands in towards their feet. Yeah. And they're going to walk them in, they press up, walk in, press up, walk in, press up. By the time they've got themselves only one foot away from their feet, their hands from their feet, because they want to then either come up from their back bend, stand up or grab their ankles or whatever, they'll be hinging again. Yeah. So even though they went in initially with control, the chances are that if they keep going deeper, 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 then they're going to hinge. Yeah. And that for me is going to be potentially problematic. Yeah? Sometimes when I see these pictures on Instagram where they go like 19, uh, 1995, uh, this was my back bend, or this was this particular position. Mm. 1998, this is my particular position. And you look at the difference, and I look at it and think, well, everything exactly the same, hips, shoulders, exactly the same, they're just hinging more in this one spot. That's the only thing that's changed, yeah? Because, I mean, this is not everybody, of course, but, you know, that bit that was mobile, they've kept going there, and they've made it more mobile or mobile, and they've sort of avoided the bits maybe where there's still restriction, yeah, in the effort to go deeper. So. It's the depth of the posture that, that I have issue with, I think. Not all back bends, just, you know, if you go really deep, you know, majority of people are going to have to hinge because the body is not designed to fold in half like that, yeah? So it has to give somewhere. If you try and bend a straw, yeah, a straw is maybe not the best analogy because it's like completely stiff, but you know how it like always goes in one place and then whenever you try and bend it again, it would just go in the same place all the time. It's a little similar to that. It's not the best analogy, but it's like that. You know, if you keep on just going to the same place all the time, that it's going to get weaker, 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 and destabilize that area, <laughs> unless you can right. have the strength to actually really maintain that. But that's the problem, is what when you lose that strength, then you've got a bit that's very mobile, and you can't control it. Mm. And that's why you need to make sure that the muscles around any area where there is hypermobility need to be strong. Mm. And if your yoga practice perhaps isn't targeting them, then maybe, you know, suggesting some supplementary exercises, some cross training. Yeah, and I mean, there's ways of, there's ways of doing all sorts of things that, that work the body in different ways, you know. You could do exactly the same sequence. So you could do your primary sequence in a way that was much more stabilizing or a way that was much more to destabilize. Well, what would a stabilizing primary sequence look like? This For me, it would be like, maybe you'd hold your standing postures for 10 breaths instead of oh, five. You know yeah. what, that's because I saw, I heard one of your lead primaries and you made the cast. Oh yeah, yeah, Utita so that was one for charity, yeah, Utita has been Angustas. It was the longest, Utita, <laughs> like, in the whole world. I know. Um, but that, so so me, there's a reason for that, uh, other than just torturing people. Yeah, okay, so, so this is, <laughs> we come into breath, okay. But I, I don't want to, you know, talk to you guys, talk the skin off you guys, but let's think, breath. Okay, does movement follow breath or does breath follow movement? Normally you say movement follows breath, yeah, that we're synchronizing the two and that breath is the key component, okay? So, therefore, if we follow along those thought lines, the breath that you use in your first sun salutations, which is normally like a three or four count breath, should be the same that you use to lower down in Chaturanga. It isn't for most people. Yeah, it should be the same that you use whether a posture is easy or difficult, which it isn't for most people. So what I did particularly on purpose in that particular sequence was to use a three to four count breath for Utita Hasta Pranagastasana. So that's a three to four count on inhale, three to four count on exhale, and then your five normal breaths. So for most people, that's like, my God, that's so long for me, but that's the same as I do every single posture. It's the same count, it's the same breath, it's exactly the same, yeah? So, but it was like, and we got that reaction from many people. It's like, what the hell are you doing? It's like, because we cheat, basically. We change our breath to suit the move, either the movement, yeah, or how difficult it is, yeah? For me, part of the challenge is to maintain the same breath, even in those times of 
discomfort or challenge mm. yeah and then that's something we can take again out of the yoga and find calmness when we met with situations that are difficult not to just change our behavior to suit the situation so like you you were mentioning the standing postures as mm. being key to bringing the stability in so are you saying yeah. that you know one way to do a stabilizing primary sequence is to at least do the standing poses with a 4-4 four, four breath count uh, at least, yeah. I mean, most people are, are sort of relatively good with some of those things. There'll be certain ones they'll cheat with. I mean, if you really want to get strong, hold them for 10 breaths, yeah. I mean, a 10 breaths with, with a 4 second inhale and a 4 second Yeah, exhale. 10 full inhales, exhales. Right. Yeah. So that's going to make your primary series pretty darn long. Yeah, so you may have to chop out half the seated postures or the... Right. I was going to say chop out the finishing sequence, but... Being a good Eshtang, yes. it was like, <gasps> how that could you naughty. do that? Yeah, It's like, yeah. funny enough, I was practicing one time at Purple Valley, and uh, Mark Roberts and Deepika were there leading it. And my practice is like ridiculously long because I keep that same breath count. And uh, so Mark and Deepika had finished. I was the last person in the shala, and they go out. And I finished my seated postures. I'd done my back bending. I think I'd done a couple of handstands. And it's like, oh shit, I've got to get ready because I've got to start massaging in half an hour. So it's like a little bit of um, meditation, like five minutes at the end. And then I hop up, Mark and Deepika are outside. And I'm like, Stu, that was a very quick finishing sequence. <laughs> it's like, what happened there? It's like, yeah, well, that had to go. Yeah, so I'm one of those naughty people that chops out that last session if there's a problem, but I'm certainly not suggesting that that should be the case if you're under time limit. Chop out whatever it is. If you're working on strength, you can't do everything. Yeah, if you if you have a certain amount of time, you can't say, well, I'm also going to do this and this and this and expect it all to fit in the same amount of time. Something has to go. So it might mean that for a certain period of time, you chop out the last half of the seated postures or something like that, if you're working on strength. Because standing postures are going to be much more strengthening than seated postures. Mm -hmm. Because seated postures are, will be active, will be, hopefully, we're not just lounging around there, we'll be engaging things. But because we're on the floor, we're not having to support our weight in the same way as when we're standing. So standing postures are really good. Adding in a couple of variations, John Scott, is a great one for adding in some variations to Paravrita Pasvatanasana. And you then are holding it for maybe 10 or 15 breaths in that sort of deep lunge, then you know you're working, mm -hmm. yeah? So those are the sorts of things that you want to do. Also in the postures themselves, you can be much more engaged than just sort of lounging around. So generally people need to work more on strength, I would say, mm -hmm. most, yoga, you know, most yoga practitioners, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, you know, you've got your, um, you know, sort of amazing body of knowledge that you've accumulated over a lifetime spent. Not all doing... stolen, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, you know, some things are, are good to, to take on board. Uh, so what, what is sort of your sort of three most influential books that you could, that you've read in your life that you think sort of change oh, things for you? Um, we're going to stick within the anatomy world, yeah, because to be honest, I rarely have time to read anything that isn't anatomy related. Even now, I don't read as much as I'd like to read. Um, so, three favorite yoga type anatomy books. The David Keel book, really awesome, I think. He presents material in a very um, logical way um, and very um, applicable way. So it makes much sense as you can apply it to the postures and things like that. Um, the David Coulter book, which predates most of these sorts of yoga anatomy books out there now, is really good. It's a bit of a heavy read, but um, he's an MD. It's a real thick one, a little bit more science-y technical, so not so approachable for most people, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. And I actually really like the Bernie Clark books. So he's got some Your Body, Your Yoga, Your Body, Your Spine, and there's another one coming out eventually, I suppose, which will be to do with the upper body. Um, it's a sort of a trilogy. Lots of stuff in there, um, thinking about individuality, yeah. Actually, there's a funny story related to that. So I, um, I was contacted him about the article, and he said, oh, look, I've written this book. Uh, do you want a copy? And let me know what you think about it. So he said, yeah, sure, send it over. So um, 
he, he posts me one and I open it up and in the front of the book it says, Stu, you are unique, uh, something, 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 uh, Bernie. And I think, wow, what a nice guy. He's really sort of thinking uh, that I'm doing something special and, and that uh, there's not many people like me. And so I was like, oh, okay. Then I start reading the book and it's like, everybody is unique. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so he's really coming from that idea of individuality and the differences and what are the average ranges of movement and what is excessive and so I, I like he's put in I can't I can't even fathom the amount of work that must have been gone in to collecting the information to create a book like that it, it's uh, phenomenal so I really those are my go-to books really I really like all of those and really respect the, the teachers themselves as well oh, thanks and um, so just a couple more questions yeah um, so if you had a magic wand and could cure one sort of yoga ill, some kind <laughs> of like common thing that you sort of a bug there. If you could cure it in one, and cure it in what one. would it be? Uh, in teaching or how people practice? You know. I, I think the the tough time people give to their knees, shall we say, yeah. Um, that's what I see a lot of, is people yanking themselves into Padmasana's, half Padmasana's. That's lotus pose. Yeah. And um, irrespective of the idea that it's going to bugger up their knee, basically. So if we could get people to calm down a little bit and take their time, open up their hips a little bit more in the right directionality, to then approach the posture from a healthier point of view. Because, you know, we're endeavoring to do yoga I see it, as I say, sitting within the health and wellness sphere. So it shouldn't be damaging bodies. Yeah? And unfortunately, we see a lot of people with meniscus issues, which has come directly from the yoga. It's, you can't blame it on anything else. It's come from placing your body in a position which is putting pressure on it. Surely, like any sport thing will injure you. Absolutely. Sport. So, I mean, it's, it's, I kind of feel yoga gets a bad rap because everyone expects it to be injury-free. I mean, you don't expect climbing to be injury-free. No, running. but we're not, we're not putting ourselves within danger's way. We haven't got a linebacker running at us at full pelt. We haven't got somebody hitting uh, some sort of object towards us. We're not running. What are we doing? We are trying to become more focused to become more aware of the body, to be conscious of this vehicle that we have, that we're using, yeah? So if you're all of those things, how can you still be hurting yourself, yeah? You could only be hurting yourself if you're unaware of what you're doing to your body, which means you haven't really identified with your body. You're sitting there with pain in your knee just because you want to be in the posture, yeah? When your body is telling you, this is hurting, Get the fuck out of this posture. You're not doing any good at all. Yeah. So we're not listening. So we are then missing the whole point of yoga, which is actually to listen and to become more aware and to become more one with our body. Mm. So I think they're, they're different. Yeah. In a competitive sport, I used to play rugby. You put me on a rugby pitch, I tear your leg off. Yeah. So it's different. I couldn't care less then if you were doing a pet mess or <laughs> not. The whole situation is different. I remember being in the front row of the scrum. Did, can I say this? It's back in the times when there was no rules, shall we say, so I'm going back to my childhood, dumping the front row of the scrum on purpose because they were going to push us over the line. That is horrific, you know? You could bust somebody's neck, yeah? You could really damage them seriously. Didn't enter into my head twice because I was in that type of environment, a competitive environment. So, I mean, thinking now, of course, I would never do it, but it didn't even occur to me that there would be problems doing that sort of thing mm. because I lived in in those times. Yeah, now the rules are much different, um, much for the benefit of of uh, rugby. But um, you come from a different perspective, I think, and the perspective that we should be in within yoga, quite rightly, I think we should get a hammering if we find people are getting hurt. Because why? To what benefit? And that's going to stop you practicing. If you get hurt, you can't practice and you want to practice. Mm. So it's detrimental to yoga as a whole, detrimental to the individual. Mm. Thanks. And um, I think we're on to just the last question, which is something that um, we at Escaping Samsara want to ask all our guests, which is... Yeah. How do you see the yoga landscape of today from your vantage point? What do you see? Oh, 
Um, you know, how how many people could I upset at once? You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like um, it's difficult to you know. I'm I'm as much a culprit as anybody else because if you say to me, uh, "What do you spend most of your time doing?" I'll say yoga. Yeah. Do I really? No. I spend most of my time doing asana. Yeah. Am I even doing it in a particularly yogic way? Probably not. Yeah. But I am associating what I do to yoga because it most closely relates that sphere. Yeah. And I think that's what most people are doing. I don't know that they're doing yoga. Yeah. Yoga to me, you know, is a more spiritual endeavor. Yeah. And so for somebody that has no concept of God, I don't see how I could be doing it. Yeah. As a person that is also not vegetarian, I don't see how I can be a yoga, a proper yogi. Yeah. That's also going to upset people. And, and, um, but I think if you truly take on the concepts, then, uh, you know, it's pretty clear that you shouldn't be eating other animals, really. And particularly as the majority of them are going to suffer in the consequences of you eating it. Yeah. Um, so, are many of these things that are called yoga now that involve you no know, stillness still yoga? I'm not sure they are. So, a lot of these flowing things where we're really transitioning, moving, to me looks more like dance than it does yoga. Now, is it not, is it beneficial for the individual? Absolutely, yeah. Is it great that they're doing it? Absolutely. Is it yoga? I'm not so sure it is really, because where's the stillness? Where's the drawing my attention in? Where's the connection with something greater? Where is all the philosophy and all of all those extra things yeah that make yoga a whole rather than a little aspect of movement yeah are there is it a movement based practice yes whatever it is you're doing that you're calling yoga are you really doing yoga probably not me me also included in that bundle easily not yeah would i say i'm doing yoga absolutely yes yeah mm. well i mean i don't want you to be too hard on yourself because you know these are like being <laughs> being <me>. vegetarian <laughs> you know it's it's not like the it's, it's not the most important thing i mean it's if you compare it to being you know kind compassionate doing some good in the world you know which is something that you do i think and you know that's important you know that's way more important and if if a physical practice starts producing that even in a little way i feel like that's a little bit of yoga right yeah, I let you go with that. Nice, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks. Right. Cheers,